You're listening to another Fighting Spirits podcast with me, Gareth A. Davis. I joined the sports promoter, Barry Hearn, at his local cricket club for an hour of conversation. It's fascinating. Enjoy, Mr. Barry Hearn. I'm here at the, um, probably the, the second or third love or in the life of Barry Hearn. We're down at East Hanningfield Cricket Club where you still turn out for the second eleven. What, what are you, um, still a kind of chin music fast bowler, Barry? <laughs> I wish, I wish. I think the fast bowling days are gone. I'm probably a two or three yard off break bowler and a middle to later order batsman. But you know what? It's the taking part that counts. Did you love the game growing up then? Yeah, I played from 12 years old with a, to a reasonably high standard club cricket level. Uh, always been passionate. Played, played against Garfield Sobers in one match, which was my claim to fame as a youngster, and Colin Milburn, people like that. My heroes were obviously Freddie Truman and Brian Statham. So I became a fast bowler early doors in my career. Took a lot of wickets uh, at schools cricket and subsequently at cricket, you know, doing the 100 wickets a season, which was always a, a nice little plug. Um, became a batsman when I got tired of running in for too many overs and didn't make my first 100 till I was in my 40s. So oh, I was a slow okay. starter. Uh, and, but still love every moment of it. And coming down to East Anningfield and playing here with these lovely people, it's just a joy. Still competitive, still want to win, you know. And uh, It never leaves you, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, we played last Saturday. We were 33 for five, but made 150 and got the other team out for 147. And I told my wife, it's probably one of the best days of my life. And it is, because it's, you, you don't lose the competition, but you appreciate the standard is not perhaps what you used to play when you were younger. Yeah, no, I played for 35 years myself and all my teammates down at uh, North Middlesex, where I played most of my career, I played a bit for Enfield and Hampstead and different mm. clubs and, and back at school and uni. And um, it's one of those games where... Once you get into it and you understand it, the nuance is so deep that you can have, because we've all dreamt, we've all had the, the, those great days mm. ourselves individually and as teams, but it's such a leveller, isn't it? You know, it really is, even may, maybe as much as boxing is even. Well, I know last Saturday, I, I batted for nearly an hour and a half for 27 because we were in trouble and I kept saying... Oh, so you put on the rescuing partnership, Absolutely. did you? Yeah, At 33 yeah. for five. You, what did you put on, 70 or 80, did you or something? No, I, well, yeah, I, put, I had two, two partnerships, one of 60-odd and one of 40-odd, which got us to 150, but my contribution was a meagre 27. But I was just there boring everyone shitless, you know. Um, <laughs> but every ball, every single ball, I said to myself, Watch concentrate, the ball. Watch concentrate, the ball. don't do anything silly, <laughs> watch the ball, watch the ball. And it's marvellous that it matters so much later on in life, you know, because most people think you're mad. It's a bit like going fishing and people say, why do you go fishing? You catch a fish and you put it back and go, yeah, but I was there. And I love the concentration and I love, you know, my fielding is poor in comparison to what you said. I was a specialist. Can you get gully. down then? No, I was a specialist gully fielder for 20 years and, yeah. and, and I was decent, but now... When I put my arm down, there's still another foot below that and the ground, which is a bit of a gap. But, you know, you take the old catch and you feel great. I just, it's difficult to describe. I just think it's, it's like diarrhoea. It runs in your genes, doesn't it? Sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> the first of, of, of many poor jokes tonight, I imagine. But um, the, the, the funny thing is, well, just before we pass on from the cricket... Um, the World Cup final, yeah. have you ever seen as exciting a cricket oh, game as yeah, that? that was you know, Ben Stokes at the end, the ball coming off yeah. the bat. You couldn't have scripted it, could no. you? We say expect the unexpected in boxing, but that is one of the most unbelievable cricket games I've ever seen. We were destined to win. Yeah. We were destined to win. And I, and I think we deserved to win. But having said that, it was a spectacle. And, and the great test of a great day of sport is how long it sits in the mind. Mm. Um, I mean, I remember being in a bar in Italy for the 1966 World Cup final, and I'll never forget that day. And you were in your 20s then, were you late, late? 18. 18. 18. Mm. And I think, looking back on that game of cricket, for anyone who knows anything or is in any way remotely passionate about cricket, they'll never, ever forget that. And, and that's a testament to what sport does. You know, you, people say, do you remember where you were when JFK was shot? Well, in my world, do you remember where you were when Eubank fought Ben the first time? Yeah. Or do you, you know, and that cricket match was special. 
Definitely. Yeah, it was one of those moments. Well, it was rather like the 2005 Ashes, a massive revival mm. for British, for English and British cricket. Okay. And this, this, but this will be the moment where all those kids are doing, you know, their, you know, their, their backward sweeps and the, the things that didn't happen when we first were playing cricket, which you could bowl to a certain side. I mean, but let, let's hope that's the case. But I'm cynically saddened by the lack of investment in sport in this country, by mm. the lack of facilities for kids, especially in underprivileged areas. So I'm not holding my breath. I mean, we're here at a beautiful cricket ground today in the knowledge that in the last 12 years, 50% of village green, village teams have gone out of business. Uh, you don't take a cursory look down into the second 11 where I play, where the, last week I had one under 30 year old and the average age was 54. So cricket's got problems along with golf and along with tennis. Sports that you have to practice and dedicate yourself to don't necessarily fit into the genre of the youngster today that'd rather be on his gaming machine or something. Mm. It's about a quick fix, and, and sports like cricket are, are a lifetime's obsession, you know. So I think despite the success of that, we've got a long way to go to get kids out inspired. They will be short-term inspired in the same way as they were with Andy Murray at tennis. But the facts are less people are playing, and that's a worry. It's funny, you know, because... Um I don't write a lot about cricket anymore. I used to write quite a lot. And just on the other side of the A12 here, uh, we're in Essex. Um, all last week, uh, Felsted School hosted the Bunbury, 33rd Bunbury Festival. And David English is a long-standing friend of mine. I've had games against his Celebrity 11, where I've had a Celebrity 11. We've raised money for charity. And um, funny thing is, I think nine or ten of that World Cup winning side had been in the Bunbury Festival and David in his ing he, 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 you know the loon yeah, yeah? Of course. I've yeah. played for him a few times exactly <laughs> well, along with Eric Clapton and mm, Barry Gibb and all mm, those guys and Viv I mean in with Viv Richards and Ian Botham yeah, and all it doesn't get better no though. exactly but the, what he was saying uh, in the piece I did with him in the Sunday Telegraph a few weeks ago was you know Boris Johnson's just come in um, he can make a dramatic change now by saying we want every state school to have access to a cricket pitch and that we want the national summer game to get um, back again in the wake of the World Cup winning. Like you say, the problem is it probably won't happen, but it really ought to because, you know, we're, we're sitting in front of a big window here watching the game as we talk. It's a way of life. Yeah, it it's, and, and it's a kind of game I've played before when grandfathers are playing with their grandchildren in the same team. It's one of the very few sports mm. where you can still play. I, 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 I think the, one of the proudest moments of my sport in life was, I think I was, I don't know what age I was, I think Eddie was 14 and we opened the batting for a, a local team near Brentwood called Brookfield. Yeah. And I think walking out to the crease with my son, opening the batting at whatever level was one of the proudest moments of my life. And I said to him, there's quite a quick bowler on here, son. I'll take number one. And I took the first over, played it out. Was it like Brian Close facing Michael Holding? Mm. I remember when he got battered around the body. Yeah, I, w I wish I was as brave as Closey because <laughs> I played with him a few times. He was a tough old boy. Yeah. Played out the first over and Eddie walked down the crease to me and said, you do know your shit, don't you? <laughs> and I just loved it. I thought, here we go. And Eddie became quite a good quick because he played Essex. Toured Barbados, toured Hong Kong, decent player, and um, gave it up on a commercial note, really said, look, I've got to spend a lot of time, there's not enough money in it, and I'm not that good to be that good, you know? But again, he will turn out every now and again, put the whites on and loves it. We've got to take a much broader look at sport in this country, it, because the danger is it's becoming dominated by fee-paying schools that have got facilities at the expense of grammar schools and technical colleges, etc., that are reliant on the government's austerity cuts and not providing any sports entertainment. It's not just cricket. I mean, it's cricket, it's tennis, it's swimming. There's got to be a time when we acknowledge how important in this country sport is for the fibre, for the character, for the aspirational level. And I believe that we should be spending more money on sport than we do on defence, because I think the real defence of our country is in the hearts and minds of youngsters that start playing cricket and learn values in life. No cheating, work hard, concentrate, all the things that you need in business, in, in commerce, in anything, that comes from your competitive nature in sport. And we are giving up on huge pockets of youngsters and just saying, 
oh, let them go and play on their Game Boy. Uh, and, and that's a worry for the next generation because I don't know where cricket and tennis and golf are going to be in 10 years' time. There's going to be a lot of people not playing those sports and it will still be massive as a TV sport. Punters like you, me and the nation will watch the big, they'll watch the open golf, they'll watch the test matches. But eventually it dies out if people don't actually play. So there's a warning sign there. The Minister of Sport, who is a sort of, I think it's just a figure that's just made up should be a full cabinet minister proper with political office yes. with authority correct to say i represent the nation's young people men women girls mm. because with sport it doesn't matter if you're muslim or christian black or white fat a or bricklayer thin. or a billionaire it doesn't, make it, it doesn't matter does it's it it's one of no. the reasons why things like darts have got successful because it's there's no barriers to entry there are barriers to entry on the bigger sports because they need facilities far more so than indoor sports and that's something the government's got to take into mind I think they've got a few other problems on their mind at the moment, but hopefully in time they'll come round to realising that's how you build a, ca a country. When you imagine how, as one we all are, during World Cup finals and cricket finals, there's no disharmony. Mm. That's not coincidence, it's because we have a common purpose, and sport gives you that common purpose and something the government should be more aware of and do something about. While we were enthusing about cricket before I started recording, you were saying how you'd taken 65 wickets in your school games in one season, and you remember proudly, and you'll, you've never forgotten it, and I'm sure it was a motivational tool that you were mentioned in the mail, that, that yeah. the national newspaper. I remember being mentioned... Um, well, the Telegraph, I mean, I ran the school's column for 20 years in the uh -huh. Telegraph, and the number of young people who I mentioned in that column, who I later met in life, who are some of our sporting stars, yeah. you, they, they are so impugned and motivated it's by easy. seeing those it's things. But you. sports ministers, mm. Barry, for years and years and years, have said they'll do this, that and the other. But they have uh, no power. They have, they no, have power. no power, no, and it is time no for that to change. It is well time for it to change. Yeah. So, I mean, what makes me laugh, and doesn't actually not laugh, makes me cry. Mm. Within 24 hours of us winning the England cricket, you know, England winning the Cricket World Cup, the entire team were at 10 Downing Street for a photo opportunity. Not good. Not good. Mm. Mm. You know, I'm cynical. What does that do? Mm. Since Theresa May wants a picture taken with the team, good luck. But really, where's the next generation of cricketers and what you're doing for them it's all very well having your picture taken with the superstars of today whether it be David Beckham or whether it be Andy Murray you've got to look at the grassroots and actually the fact that they want their picture taken so quickly is just a publicity stunt to show that they're one of the people and in fact they're not one of the people because if they were they'd be doing something for the people I'm here with the one and only Mr Barry Hearn who has I think probably had must be close to five decades now involved in sport. Yeah, I started in 74, so I'm 45 years in so far, and counting. And I'm sure it'll never end. Look, let, um, before we go and talk about how you really got in and began, um, let's have a quick chat about Anthony Joshua. Mm. Uh, announced last week um, that he's going to fight in... Uh, in Riyadh, on the northwestern outskirts of Riyadh, December the 7th, in the rematch against Andy Ruiz. Let me ask you, first of all, how much advice was asked of you um, about whether he should take the Andy, Rima, Andy Ruiz rematch first? And what was your instinct? Was it to leave it with him? Because you talked to Bob Arum, you talked to Frank Warren, you talked to George Foreman, and many others who you know and, and respect or not in, in the boxing world, mm -hmm. but who, who, who know what's happened in the past with Muhammad Ali, with Floyd Patterson, with different people, how they earned the world titles back by not going back in against an opponent who was perhaps difficult for them the first time. What was your first take on it after June the 1st, Barry? I think we were all in a state of shock that, that Joshua got beat, and I think we all acknowledged he got beat by the better man on the night, mm -hmm. which was even more shocking because... Andy Ruiz is always a tough opponent. We, we knew everything about him, all his amateur fights, his professional fights. We knew he was capable. He didn't look as if he should be capable. He looked like a pizza delivery man. But the appearances can be deceptive, and we weren't deceived by that. Nor was Anthony. The training camp was first class. Everything was good. Walked onto one, got beat. Uh, end of story. That's uh, welcome to the world of heavyweight boxing. Do we immediately... Obviously, our job is a fiduciary job to look after the interests of Anthony Joshua. The contract, therefore, with Ruiz getting his opportunity, there was one of four opponents 
Ruiz was selected, he accepted the challenge, paid a lot of money to be challenger for the World Heavyweight title, signed for a rematch, won, no, no, no long-term no long -term difficult contract, but the insurance policy, if something goes wrong, that Joshua's got one chance back at it, and if not, Ruiz wins again, he's a free agent, so good luck to the boy. Um, do you take your chance? Yes, of course you do. Um, anyone who says different, just looking for column inches because you would fancy the job against Andy Ruiz 99 times out of 100. Um, doesn't mean to say you're complacent, but at the same time, you're confident of winning. And of course, money talks sense. Um, to go away and have uh, to lose the opportunity of a rematch means that you would come back as a challenger with no claims and you'd obviously be in a, a weaker negotiating position. And it's three belts, of course, three of the principal belts. Absolutely. And so you're right back in the frame. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. one fight away, or you know, alternatively, one fight away from saying, is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Yeah, exactly. So it's it, the, the reward is huge, but the risk is the, huge. The downturn is massive, yeah. because if you get beat in the second fight, then you, you may not be finished, but you know, as a commercial operation, it's a massive dent. You, to get over one, as a lot of people did, Lennox Lewis and people like that came back after one shock defeat uh, and they got bigger and bigger and better and better Lennox particularly his second half of his career was so much better than his first half so the, it wasn't a choice about do we let Ruiz just walk away with all the belts without having to go and try and get them back don't be ridiculous that was you know anyone who says that <laughs> you know, they're cloud cuckoo land but that's okay because there's a lot of poor operators out there anyway this is the right fight this is a fight that Joshua likes he wants redemption, all the matters that goes, and financially, which is because at the end of the day, Anthony Joshua makes the final call on everything we do. I had no influence whatsoever in, do you want the Ruiz? We asked him, do you want the, 100% yes, go and get it for us. That's our instructions from our client, we deliver. Do you want to go to Saudi Arabia? This is the deal there. There are four or five venues around the world wanted that fight. We would prefer budgets for each one. And we would look at the ups and downs, the pitfalls, culture, politics, whatever. Mm. And we would sit down as a team, final choice, Anthony Joshua, yes. And, of course, we were mindful that Andy Ruiz wanted, really, although he had no control over the venue or the date because he'd already signed away that control, we were mindful that he didn't really want us to be in England. You know, the, he wanted to be in Mexico City, quite rightly, because it's his homeland. He, didn't have, he doesn't have the power to specify where the venue was, but we could see his mindset about, don't want to be, I don't want to give Anthony Joshua a hometown advantage. So in are the you end- saying that, Are you saying that um, Cardiff was genuinely an option? Oh then? yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, had we not accepted the Saudi deal mm. and potentially one other Middle East deal, then we would have- Dubai, I understand. Really. Mm, no. No, no, but not far away. Okay. Um, we would definitely have gone to Cardiff, no question. Um, clearly, it was a better financial offer for, for AJ to go to Saudi, but also in, our, in AJ's mind and our mind is we, did, we wanted to take away any excuse from Rui saying this is not fair and home advantage, we thought, features. And I think he's confirmed that he's happier not to be boxing in England. Not to say we wouldn't have gone if we had to have gone, We'd, we'd love Cardiff, and, and AJ loves to entertain his UK fight fans, but there's time and a place for that. All we're focusing on is getting the title back. Um, having met Ruiz and spent a little bit of time with him on my own, I just, I'll be honest with you, I think he's just going to fight the way he fights. I don't think the venue bothers him at all. I think he's a big lad. He's always been a big lad. When he was seven, he was fighting 13-year-olds because he was so heavy. Yeah. And he, he's used to being around big guys. He's a better boxer than he looks, as we much, know. Much he's got faster hand speed than he looks. He's got more power than he looks. Mm. And you watch the fight back, which I have several times, maybe four times, actually. Um, Anthony was still looking for that finish at the, at the end. And, and he ha did have to go gung-ho because he didn't no. know where he was. No, he didn't know where um, he was. I don't yeah, think he yeah. knew anything after that, yeah. that big shot in the third. But... No, you know, Ruiz can fight, we all know that. But look, we don't want a heavyweight division, and I'm not having a go at anybody here in particular, but we don't want a heavyweight division where there are massive odds on favourites. I mean, the bookmakers made Joshua a huge odds on favourite for that fight. 
silly bookmakers, what do they know about boxing? They don't know anything about boxing, but they know a lot about the weight of money. So the punter's money was going on. Joshua, he became a huge favourite. The fact of life is that was a good level heavyweight fight. Take away the what, what each fighter looked like, your man mounting against pizza delivery boy, as far as technical ability, a very well-matched fight. And heavyweight division, especially with the money these boys are earning, deserves those type of fights. And we have this bizarre situation, heavyweights, with three broadcasters all desperate to, to keep hold of their bit of talent. Mm -hmm. You know, ESPN with Tyson Fury and Showtime with Deontay Wilder and obviously DAZN and Sky with AJ. But they've got to also remember that to keep that pot boiling, that pot boiling, mm. you've got to fuel it with proper fights. And Ruiz was a proper fight. Fast hands, good feet, very good feet for a big man. As I say, I know lots of bodybuilders, Gareth, that look sensational. <laughs> they can't fight at all. <laughs> so don't worry about appearances. Um, when you saw the reaction to the, the fight announcement, you know, just over a week ago now as it is, um, did you expect there to be a bit of a backlash from British fans and also from organisations like Amnesty International mm. that were complaining about the human rights record in Saudi yeah. Arabia? I think there's two things there. I mean, you always expect backlash from British fans because British fans, quite rightly, selfish as we all are, they want the fight in England. So 80,000 of them can go to it, so they're going to miss out on an opportunity and, to go and to it. My wife was, by the way, a part of that British fan saying, what are you doing? I'm not, I can't travel all the way over there, but I would have loved to have gone to see AJ in wherever. I just have to hold my hands up and say, look, you know, sorry, there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture here. Business? Business. It's, it, sport is business. And the day you take your eye off sport being business is the day sport goes backwards. And we talked earlier about the cricket and the golf and the tennis and the investment that's not being made. Same thing if I was a boxing. What we've done with boxing over the last five years, and in particular, that's off to my son, I don't take any credit for it, is inspire the generation of young kids to be professional boxers and to make the sacrifices to make themselves as good as they can be. And they deserve, they deserve the reward. So you can't do that and then just give them a medal or a cup or a belt. You've got to give them money. So their life changes because of the risks they take and the, and the level of dedication they put in. So that, the fan side, I can shrug my shoulders and say, look, don't worry, hopefully he'll be back again in the future, but we are a global sport. And as such, we have a global audience to cater for. Uh, as far as the, the political and the cultural side, side of Saudi, yes, I was expecting some backlash on that because there are people out there, and quite rightly, defending the rights of individuals across the world against many different member states of people that abuse power or create criminal acts or whatever. But your daughter or your wife would have to, for example, if they wanted to be at that fight, would perhaps have to seek special dispensation to go to the event. Well, for let, let me say this is, I'm not justifying it at all, but what I'm seeing is change, slow change. Three or 400 years ago, we used to do a lot of things in our country that we probably would be ashamed to admit to now. and. By example, things change, and sport can be part of that process. It's a long haul, but the alternative is just cutting people off. I think I, I spent some time talking to Keith Pelly of the PGA European Tour, who's a very sensible young man, because he took a European Tour event there and had the similar sort of things, how can you do this in a country that does such and such? And Keith's answer, and I think my answer is, look, our responsibility is towards, his responsibility towards his members to provide the best tournaments to spread the game as globally as possible. I take exactly the same view in all the sports I deal in. My overall consideration is the world of sport. Politics being politics, I'm sure there's things all over the world that I could take offence with, but I just focus my interests on spreading the gospel of sport and making sure that my clients are well rewarded for the activities within their chosen sport. Are you going to fight week in December? Absolutely, I would not miss it for an AJ fight, are you sure? Um, so, AJ wins back the belts, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are two even bigger fights out there yeah. then. There is Tyson Fury still, 
Yeah. There is Deontay Wilder. Yeah. We even even if he loses, they're still marketable in a sense. But but like you said, let, let's talk about it in the event that he wins because yeah. then they are mega fights, bigger than any fights we've probably ever seen in the UK. How soon? Obviously, we understand that Wilder and Fury will probably meet in February, March next year. Yeah. Do you want him to fight both of those guys, and where would you like to see those fights take place? Well, I want to see him fight both those guys. I think now is the right time for him to fight both those guys, but clearly they have their own contractual obligations. I imagine that Wilder will get through Ortiz in, in a decent fight. If it is Ortiz. If it is. Uh, and then he'll be looking for another fight February, March time, thereabouts, which may well be Fury, but... Dylan White's got to have a, a say in that at some stage. Certainly after the, uh, well, certainly after the, if there is one Tyson Fury fight, he would certainly be ensconced by then. As always, politics in boxing will get complicated, and money is the thing that always resolves. Let's wait and see how things go in Saudi. We we will, I believe, if we put on the type of show we're going to put on, we will potentially see the birth of a whole new market. For professional boxing as one state begins to outbid another state for the right to host the next super fight so you think they that that might even go east then those big fights the, i think it has the potential to so it's early doors and i'm looking into a crystal ball but there is you know you britain has led the way uk has led the way in professional in the resurgence of professional boxing globally Having said that now, America is gaining steam under Eddie's guidance with the zone deal. There's an awful lot of factors coming in. It's about the time of the fight, the airtime, the pay-per-view opportunities, the subscriber base that's likely to be interested. So it's a very complicated scenario. But it comes down to how big, how big the fights are. Fury, Wilder, Joshua, should they materialise, are massive, massive fights. I wouldn't like to say where in the world they're going to be. I think you're going to find a lot. Bear in mind how inexpensive it is in the bigger picture. You know, some people buy football clubs to be famous for billions of dollars. It's funny, you know, because last night I was um, just thinking about how the Rumble in the Jungle, the most watched mm. and the most talked about fight ever between George Foreman and Muhammad Ali, was in Zaire at a time when Mobutu was one of the worst dictators the world's ever seen. Yeah. And, and in fact, not a lot of people... I'm, I'm sure there are, I haven't gone back and dug out articles. When was it? We're talking 74, aren't we? Because mm. um, 75 was no then one Manila. At the I bet they did. There, was a hand, I, there were a handful of people. I'm sure there were articles if I go yeah, on microfiche yeah, yeah, and look yeah, back in time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there have been fights all over the world. But um, finally, on Anthony Joshua, is he one of the most special boxers? Because we're going to talk about your life and your career in boxing as well. Yeah. Is he one, yeah, one of the most interesting, one of the most talented, one of the most fascinating ever to promote? Yes, in a nutshell, because I've never found someone with such a balance of dedication and, if you like, personality-led, charismatic characters. Um, I have to say, as always with me, it's brutal honesty. There's a dent in, in his CV because he got a zero. Now, he can go on from that if he has the character, and I believe you he lost does. The, he lost the zero, you mean? He lost the yeah, zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it, and, and where I was aiming Joshua for was, as I've always said, can you be unbeaten for 10 years? Well, the answer to that question was yes, and now it's no. And we have to live in the real world. So now it's a question of how do you bounce back? How do you, put that, how do you go on to the next level of your legacy planning? The legacy planning is to grow Joshua into a truly global star. In the, I mean, it, you can't say he's going to be the next Muhammad Ali because comparisons don't work. But at that level, in terms of you can be a lot more famous in this world than you can with Ali because of social media and all the various bits and pieces. So he is very special in my 45 years as being the most charismatic, well-rounded, nice man who can fight. Now we need to take him to the next level and he has to regain that destructive urge where he flattens people because that's what makes heavyweight boxing so exciting. Now, you were born in 1948. Um, you are Barry Maurice William Hearn. Morris, Morris. Ma Ma Maurice, Maurice, so French, Maurice. No. sorry, sorry. So I'll start it again. Barry Morris William Hearn. Um, you are a promoter. 
you're the chairman of Matchroom Sports, um, Sport. Um, you've been involved in pool, 10-pin bowling, golf, the, the PGA Euro, Euro Pro Tour, table tennis, fishing. Um, you've been chairman of the Professional Darts Corporation, World Professional Billiards and Snooker Association, and the chairman of L Leighton Orient Football Club, of course. You're still chairman of that? No, I'm lifetime non-executive president, okay, uh, well, and I'm happy with Still that. involved? Still involved. involved. But only you have to go to board meetings four times no, a year. No, I never whatever. have to go to board okay. meetings. Okay, yeah, because <laughs> you know what happens? You get bored, yeah, don't you? Because yeah, 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 you're, 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 you're a doer, aren't you? Yeah, no, now, um, obviously, you know, I always see you and Eddie as two pe your son Ed Edward, Eddie, um, as two peas in a pod. He he's very similar to you. He in fact, he might even be smoother than you as a talker, no, no, you know, and I'm not, I'm not no, no. disparaging you at all. I think he's a brilliant salesman. Mm -hmm. He's very honest about what he is. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, you wanted some honesty out of him. You talked earlier about batting together in cricket, how proud it was. Um, and I, I, I need to just go back to this there was a time when you wanted to test him physically as well wasn't there yeah. um when he when he it was probably after you'd batted together yeah, um when you when you 16 yeah i mean i always had this thing about whether my son was going to be a you know i mean i i came up very normal extremely normal but my son was obviously the, well the council estate in dagenham is what you yeah, mean that's yeah. right my dad was a bus driver and you yeah. know i could look after myself but it was a normal working class upbringing and you washed cars you picked fruit and vegetables anything anything yeah. to make a living yeah, yeah. i've never changed it's you told about, me once i loved a pound note you know i, I still love a pound note <laughs> because it, otherwise what, what am i doing here what am i doing yeah. here i've always worried about eddie whether he was going to turn out to be just a rich kid's son because you'd sent him to Brentwood School, yeah, private right. school. Yeah, that's right. And he had all, you know, he, he, as he says now, you can't change, you can't criticise the cards you're dealt. That was his, the, the hand he was dealt. It was my job as a parent to give him the best I could. What if he was, what if, what if he had an accent like, no. I, I'm not saying I speak very public schooly, but I do have a slight public school oh, yeah, twang. Yeah, yeah. What, are, are, you, are you happy that he's got the Essex? Because it adds to him, doesn't it? I never it? even think of him in any other way. But, oh, than but, just Eddie. Yeah. But we, we got to a stage where he got bigger and bigger, and he was having a few fights uh, outside and inside the ring, you know, getting a bit lively. A big I, lad? Big lad, 6'3", whatever, yeah. at 16, is a big lump. And I just said to him, it's time for me to find out what type of bloke you really are. Let, we'll go down the gym and we'll have three rounds proper. Small gloves. We'll have head guards and gum shields, but we'll have a proper tear up. Your wife wasn't happy, though. She was absolutely incensed. And the last words were, if you hurt my son, I'm going to kill you. Uh, and this is fact, Susan, yeah. In, yeah. in fact, it didn't work out like that at all, because I did, you know. Come on, the bell rings. Let's go through it a little bit. Let's do a little bit of commentary. Yeah, we, bell rings first round. Is there a bit of an audience as well? A few lads around the gym. Quite, 10 or 15? Yeah. Uh, embarrassing. Excuse me, lads. I need the gym. I need it three rounds. Two-minute rounds. No, take a chance. I was 48 or something. And what was he? 16. 16. Yeah. So, <laughs> bell goes. I look at his face. He's 16. He's not frightened of anyone. He's up for it. He comes charging over to me, and I hit him with the right hand straight on the point of the gym that zings up my fingers like a beauty. You know, when you hit someone hard, in my little experience, you don't feel it if you hit it right. I didn't feel it but he didn't fall over. And I thought, I could have a problem here. Anyway, we carried on first round. So he's got a chin, you he's found that straight away. He had a chin, I was, <laughs> I was never a big puncher anyway, but he had a chin. Uh, he started getting more and more aggressive and that was okay. We had a decent first round, I think. Um, Who won it? I'd probably give it to him on work rate, but but with me on quality of shots. Did you have anyone there scoring it or no, not? No, no, okay. no, no. I mean, they all. Did sit. you have a referee? No, but they were just sitting there, standing around in awe of what's going on here. The governor's got his boy in, and they're both trying to kill each other. <laughs> second round, he came out and started hitting me to body shots and dropped me twice in the second round. Brutal body shots. I was out. Okay. I wasn't too bad getting it in the face, Gareth, to be honest with you, because there's not a lot of feeling in a thick old head like I've got. But the body, as I always say to fighters, it's the, it's the most underrated punch in the world. So he's hit me once in the body. I've gone down, got my breath, got up, thought, this looks bad. I was more conscious that it looked bad in front of other people. And he came in like a ferocious little animal that he is. I went down right at the end of the second round. Bell went. And I said, that'll be, that's enough, son. And he said, Eddie said, you said you'd do three rounds. And I went, do you want to kill your dad? <laughs> I said, two's more than enough. But I left the gym happier than him. 
because he proved something to me and that's all I wanted to know. And I've never had to ask that question again. Is he a spoiled kid or is he like me? Is he a proper player and a proper man? And he's a proper man. I don't need to be... So from then onwards, the bond that was already very strong become unbreakable. So if I'm in the jungle or I'm in the trenches, I'll have Fast Car ready next to me every day, even if he did go to public school. It's funny, you know, I, I sat with him... You know, I've got to know both of you pretty well over the years. And, um, I mean, God, we go back to the day when we were being lounge lizards in, um, <laughs> in, in hotels in America with Nazim Hamid and stuff. We'd sit around all day where it was different. I was going to say was, it's a good job um, that boxing match between you and him didn't happen today because it would have done millions of views on social media, wouldn't it? And, and you, people would have been making memes of you forever. Forever. No, you that, that would... It wasn't recorded, presumably. No, it wasn't. It yeah. what, a, what a relief. What, no, what a shame. <laughs> I've, I've actually That's got, the promoter speaking I, there. I, I've actually got a couple of films of Eddie boxing in, when he was amateur. Yeah. And they're difficult to watch because I was so nervous that I couldn't hold the camera still. But he... I think it's, it's good. I don't think he'd like me to release those because he did look like a jack-in-the-box jumping up and down. Like a, You know, the amateurs tend to jump up and down rather than shift forward. Mm. But uh, no, he, he finished off, I think he's 18 or something like that. And he, I remember him coming home one day and he said, I think I'll jack this boxing in. Well, I said, well, no, if you're not enjoying it, don't do it. But, you know, don't worry about me. My opinion doesn't count. Why is that? What, 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 what made you think like that? And he said, a couple of travellers came in the gym tonight. He said, I don't think I'm ever going to be as tough as them. And I thought that sums up boxing because I've never known anyone from a a middle-class background, be a good boxer, be, you know, be a decent world-class boxer. You need that hunger and you need that working-class upbringing and it is a tough game. Um, you, you can't invent that. Um, I had a few beers with him in, in Los Angeles when Kroller and Lomachenko fought, I think it was, a couple of days before that. And he, he was brilliant with me that day. And we, we did loosen up a little bit. We were, I recorded it, it went out on TalkSport. I did a big piece in the Telegraph with him and he was telling me then, you may have read it, he said, I'm prepared to die, Mm. like a boxer is in the ring, for his family and his honour. I don't know if you read this, he said, I'm prepared to die for my dad and my family, for this company, um, as a workaholic. No less than I would ask, no more than I would give. It's But he's learnt from you not to have a heart attack, he told me. Yeah, Yeah, well, that's good. If you can avoid that, it's fine. You're not a certainty. That's out of your hands. All we can do is try our nuts off every day. Be as honest as we can. Tell the truth because it's a lot easier than telling lies. Make sure that you back up every plan with a sustainable plan for moving everybody forward. But you have to commit. And you have to be like a poker player, you have to be all in. And in our family, we're all in. We're, we're tough to beat. I mean, you know, we're relentless to a level I've never seen anyone as relentless as us. Well, it's, it, you, you, your, your, your work and your play are symbiotic, aren't they? There's a synergy there with both of you that, you know, um, you do take downtime. But, I mean, it's extraordinary that... Um, I know because I've had a family myself and my children have grown up. The, the amount of time that is taken away from you that you can't have with your kids if you're going to be committed well, to work. It's part of the sacrifice mm. you make. We are sportsmen to sacrifice their lives. Mm. So why on earth shouldn't people that organise sports events sacrifice theirs as well? Because if you want to be the best you can, you can't leave a stone unturned. You just can't do it. It's like you writing a piece and saying, well, that wasn't very good, but file it anyway. You would never do it. There's deadlines, though, and so sometimes it's all about, if I've got all day, I'll take all day. That's it's not, then take all night or the night before. I mean, there's no way you can ever go out with anything other than your very best. You started boxing as a promoter in 1987, yeah? Mm -hmm. And your first promotion, (laughs) Frank Bruno against Joe Bugner. What do you remember of that? It was actually my third promotion. Was it third? Because I, I'd done two little Gary Mason shows at, at the Cliffs Pavilion in South Bless Africa. his heart. Rest in so, peace. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Terry Lawless asked me to do it because I think Terry Lawless and Mickey Duff were trying to get me to work for them because I was a young, sort of a fairly mouthy promoter type. Mm. Um, I don't work for people, as you know, so that was never going to happen. But once I did a couple of little shows with Gary Mason, I got the bug and I decided I wanted to do something big. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew as a fight fan but what I would, I wanted to do shows that I would buy a ticket for. And of course, ever since Henry Cooper got beat, 
by <laughs> ever since Henry Cooper got beat for the British title by Bugner. By Bugner. Do you think he won that? I think I think every, the authorities were virtually told, "Give it to the younger bloke. It's time for him to go." Half a point in those days, yeah, wasn't it? Do you remember Harry uh, Grab? I'm not Harry. Harry, 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 Harry Gibb. Gibb. Harry Gibb, who gave who gave the Eubank one round victory over Nigel Ben in the second fight, so he was consistent. Um, what I think was. I knew that Frank Bruno was the nation's hero. I knew that no one liked Joe Bugner, that he had previous with Henry Cooper. It was just a fight that I, I, I would have walked 100 miles to watch that fight. So why don't no you brainer. make it? Why don't you make it? Yeah. I got in touch with them. Somehow or the other, I won't go into details because it would take more than an hour to explain. Somehow or the other, I got it signed up against all the odds. And it happened. And to this day, it's still one of the top 10 all-time audience records on ITV. What, what was it? 17 million? 18.7. Yeah. Greg Dyke was the head of London Weekend Television at the Greg time. Greg Dyke right? bought it off me. That's right. Two, a quarter of a million, wasn't it? Yeah. He said, how much do you want for this fight? I said, 200,000. He said, I don't think you can deliver it. So he gave you 50 grand more, didn't he? He said, if you can deliver it, I'll give you 250. That's right, yeah. I said, you've just done 250, son. Because when I say I deliver something, trust me. I deliver. 18 million, when you think about that I now. I know, it's 18.7. World Cup final probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> incredible. Um, down, down the down time then, of course, you know, you mentioned Chris Eubank there, Nigel Benn, Lennox Lewis, Nassim Hamid, Steve Collins, Herbie Hyde. I mean, there's so many more. Hundreds I mean, I'm, and hundreds and no, hundreds. I'm talking about, this is all pre-Eddie, of course, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Before Eddie, and Eddie's nearly a 10 year. Yeah. for France. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Francis Ampofu, yes. Michael Ayers. I yeah. mean, just nights of small hall shows that were great, you mm -hmm. know. And they're my heroes, you see. I mean, I know it sounds a bit weird. These these guys are my heroes, not, not the other way around. And if we can help them change their life. And also, I'm really proud to look at some of the fight. Most of the fighters have gone on to do quite well after they've left us. I hope we've installed a little bit of discipline and understanding of credibility and integrity in their lives. I mean, Francis Zampoufa, I think he's the biggest egg supplier to Marks and Spencers in the country. You know? Really? Really? He came over on a blooming boat from Ghana. I, didn't, I mean, he lived in Bethnal Green. He had nothing. He's got a chicken farm now. He's got it? massive, really? massive. He's Where is a, he? Up in Norfolk yeah, or Suffolk or somewhere? Yeah, is he? I mean, he put all his money into this bit of land, and now he's like, it's huge, and he, no one deserves it more. And I, I love stories like that, people that have come from nothing, because I came from nothing, and I can say, I know it's not easy. But stick with it and believe in yourself. You'd be surprised what you can do. We're going to continue talking about your life in boxing now. 45 years, as you told me just now, Barry, um, as the, uh, the tees get opened here at the cricket ground. I think we've got a couple of overs left. Note the players are making their, their way off the pitch. All the sandwich boxes, cartons are being opened. So there'll be a little bit of noise behind us. I'm it's just... a proper interview in a proper surroundings, exactly, isn't it? In a proper cricket ground. Um, um, what have been the best and worst? You mentioned Francis on and Pofo and how brilliantly he's done. Um, we all love Francis. What, what, what are the best and worst nights you've had? What was the best night you've ever had in best boxing? Night, without doubt, 1990 Eubank Ben won, uh, NEC Stadium. Gambled just about every night. I mean, we weren't doing particularly well then as a company. I really believed in Eubank. I thought Styles make fights. I thought he had the fight won. So we gambled everything on staging that fight, making sure it happened. And it came off, uh, and one of the great nights of, you know, again, there's a book. Each one of our stories, Gareth, is, a, is like a book almost in, really? in each night because so many things happen. A worst night, without doubt, featured Eubank as well, was Michael Watson. You know, uh, a man I'm proud to call a friend who's made a, an amazing recovery, if you can call it such, you know, in terms of he's led a useful got life. Got to his 50s. He's got, in his uh, 50s now. Uh, yeah. Just an amazing person, an amazing story. A guy that shows you that when you're winning... Hands down, you still have to be careful because this boxing is a very cruel sport and it can be taken away from you in a, in a, heart, in a heartbeat. As Anthony Joshua found that out in the third round when he looked like going home early to having his, his rings taken away from him. When you look at Watson, absolutely hand, hands down winning that fight against Eubank. Just walked on to one uppercut and the whole of history and the whole of his life changed and in a weird, weird way and boxing changed for the better. Mm. It took well, the, it, it to took put the history there that, that they sued the board yeah. um, over Michael Watson's uh, team sued the board over the fact there wasn't provi pro um, enough 
medical care afterwards, yeah. and it has changed the provision for it boxers at uh, major events. It took a disaster to make other people's life safer, mm. and Michael Watson should never be forgotten for that. Yeah. Yeah. Spencer Oliver always thanks yeah. the Michael Watson yeah, situation for the life. fact that save he's you know he's a broadcaster now. Yeah. He'd, he'd love to box again, but he, it saved his life. You know, there's a big horseshoe cut in or, or stitches yeah, in his head, and he's and he's fine. He's fine, as are many other fighters, and there's still tragedies within boxing, which some of which are unavoidable because of the nature of the sport mm. but we can make it with you know with everyone's help we can make it as safe as possible without ever taking making it completely safe because it can't be it is in your view I mean as I say um, when I mention all those names I mean it, it's an extraordinary uh, list of you know from from Frank Bruno to, to the biggest names in British sport in the last 40 years basically um, as, w as we get older mm. um, and as the players move in and get their tees behind us you can just hear them um, what qualified you to understand boxing and have that nuanced feel for it but did, did was there boxing in the background in the family was no. there did you always have a feel for it what, did, was there ever a time when you didn't know if you'd be able to, obviously you really understand the sport now yeah. instinctively more than you ever would have. Bo boxers have always been working man's heroes. And why? Because they come from nothing and they struggle against the odds to change their life. So there's an empathy between us. I can remember at six, seven, eight years old being underneath my bedclothes listening to the fights coming in from America on a transistor. On the wireless. Radio, on the wireless. <laughs> And you, you build up dreams of these guys that come out of the mines or come out of the working men's clubs or whatever, and suddenly they're your hero. I developed a love of the sport. I always wanted, Gareth, in all honesty, when I was growing up, I dreamed of being heavyweight champion of the world. Seriously? But I was never, ever going to be any good. I don't know why. So you genuinely dreamt oh, of yeah. that? Yeah. I, 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 to my mind, Ali was the greatest thing that ever walked the stage. But then I used to go behind him. I used to love Dempsey. I used to love Willa. I, mean, I, I followed so many things historically about it. Having the love for that, then moved over to going to watch shows. And I thought the shows I was watching didn't help my love. They were poor. Mismatches, Mickey Mouse fights, just nicking money off punters. Occasional good one. Poor standard. And, and it just occurred to me, sort of, when I got into the sort of 70s, I think I could do better than this. And I really, and my aim was always from day one, uh, and I'm out of boxing now, so it doesn't matter. Are you not involved day to day? I mean, I'm not, not at all involved day to day. Eddie and I discuss it socially. Because we always say privately that you're the boss, though. No, 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 but I'm the boss of the company. In other words, when the boxing department comes to me and says, these are our results for the financial year, I have a comment to make. I don't have a comment to make on individual shows because they're much better than me. Frank Smith, Eddie Hearn, there's 30 people working in matchroom boxing now. It's not a little shop corner business there. It used to be part time for, for Mickey Duff and, you know, in Wardour Street. You know, it's not like that. This is a major global business and it needs the respect. It needs the finance. It needs the, the, the integrity and the honesty that run major global businesses. We're doing deals for hundreds of millions of pounds. Therefore, we've got to make sure that we're running a proper business. It's not a joke, you know, you're, I'm a boxing promoter. Everyone wants to be a boxing promoter. You know, we run a global sports business, 12 different sports, 650 event days this year around the world, 40,000 hours. Two a day, basically. More than two a day sometimes. <laughs> 40,000 hours of television footage. And that's a major business. It's not a fly by night. You know, and we are one of the top UK companies, one of the top global companies in our industry, probably the biggest independent sports promotion company in the world. That brings about a responsibility, and our responsibility is to put on good shows. We'll always get criticised, of course. Put on good shows, look after the fighters, make sure that everyone gets as much value for money as we can possibly give them. And we make money as well. Now, if it all comes together, we've had the perfect life, and there'll be always be a few hiccups along the way. Um, given that this is a boxing show, have you, in the last few years, um, you know, obviously Eddie's done a brilliant job and he's taken it on for you as well. And he, he I disagree with him all the time. Do you? Yeah, all the time. What's the last disagreement you had? I said, Lomachenko Campbell 
I said, that's never going to sell out the O2. I said, Lomachenko's brilliant for us boxing people, but do the wider public know him? And Campbell's a great fighter and a great kid. And the, but, and the arena sold out in... Two days. 24 hours. Yeah. Well, so, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I remember speaking myself in Vegas to, to Bob Arum and him asking, yeah. what do you think? Uh, just kind of asking me as a punter, what do you think? I said, you've got no worries with Lomachenko coming because the British public's interest, A, he won a gold medal in the London 2012 Games. Not that, that everybody knew who he was then, but the general interest yeah. in the likes of people and like him is wanna, huge. I think they, they want a night out. They want to say, I was there. Because exactly. if he does turn out to be one of the best, yeah. best. Oh, I but think he's already getting see, there. What I'm saying is life and boxing and life in business are very similar. It's about levels. It's about how you operate. Mm. And, and I'm saying, I'm not having to push anyone there. Eddie has produced a company of some very talented individuals, because you're only as good as the team you've got, that have taken boxing and boxing promotion to another level. And, and that's pretty obvious in the UK. But when I look at America, their boxing promotions in America are largely totally woeful, covered up by one or two big bashes. When you look at the average show in the States, no wonder boxing's gone down the hip. And why, no wonder UFC's taken it over because they don't give people value for money. Eddie's changing that. And the shows in the States are getting to be magnificent quality. It's still going to take two or three years to convince everyone that boxing's back. But he's on his way and he's doing it the right way. But I don't know anyone else could do it because it's... You've got to have a huge amount of credibility in terms of financial credibility to back your corner because you can't go in as a poor person. It doesn't work. And you've also got to have the charismatic characters like Joshua and like Eddie. And today's world is about social media followers, old farts like me. We're, we're, we're yesterday in terms of actually milking the podcasts and the, the social media comments that actually sell tickets. I mean, Eddie's got nearly a million followers on Twitter. You know... No worry, no wonder he sells his shows out quicker than anyone else. He's only got to put out one tweet. I was sticking up posters outside Bethnal Green Station trying really? to sell tickets. Really? The world has changed. You, you, you literally were with a yeah. van and a group of lads sticking posters up. Two o'clock in the morning, if anyone else puts a poster up on top of mine. Cover it. Yeah. Oh, oh, you've got there, things to there'd say. There'd be murders. Murders <laughs> going on. <laughs> it's another world now. We don't even produce posters anymore. No, but you have to acknowledge... Uh, the world is a changing place. Boxers are a changing people. They've got better advice. They've got more chance of making money and more chance of keeping money. And the best advert we can have for boxers is to leave behind us a succession of well-done stories. The Francis Ampufus, the Darren Barkers, the Tony Ballews, the Carl Frotches, independently wealthy, carry themselves like gentlemen, paying their way, respectful. And that is the legacy that you want to leave in boxing. It's the best advert for the sport there ever could be. One of the things that is more serious um, that does come up a lot, I wanted to get your views as we kind of close on the hour, is um, uh, performance enhancing drugs in boxing. It's tightening up all the time. The testing's better. Um, what's your view on on, on anti-doping in boxing? Zero tolerance for any type of drug. I'm accepting that there will always be fighters out there that will take the wrong road, the shortcut. But at the same time, the testing procedures, especially if you're going to enrol in this, I've been very impressed with VADA. You know, it costs a lot of money, somewhere around $40,000 a fighter to, to actually administer the test. It's extremely thorough. They do. do you think there should be one, obviously we've got WADA, which well, is the world anti-doping. I don't anti think everybody but, could afford it, that's the problem. But, so you don't think they're, because there's been talk about, obviously we, we know about the situation with UCAL, I know it's under yeah. lawyers with Dillian White and so on at the moment, you, we, you can't talk about that on this show because you know, that has to come out yeah, in the process I'm, of time. I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm confident, I'm confident that justice will be done at the moment and I'm confident in Dylan White's case that justice will be done we just have to wait for that announcement in September let's see what happens there the overall principle of cheating remains as being the death knoll of sport in a, like, in a sport like boxing it has even more repercussions because it can give you an advantage which could actually hurt physically hurt your opponent not just win the fight but physically hurt him but it could also end so up in a, in, a, in a corporate manslaughter case or a, or a, or a, you know. but at the level we operate at we can afford VADA testing on all our major fights and I sleep well at night knowing that is the case 
I'm not so sure about lower down the batting order, as we're in a cricket club, that that is practical for smaller fights because those small, show, small hall shows are under enough pressure already. Whether this is a government-led thing, we have UCAD, as we know. They are not as detailed as they'll admit themselves as VADA, but they are decent and they have an opinion to be listened to. I just think that this is a battle we have to win because if we don't win it, then sport as we know it ceases to exist. So it's zero tolerance for me. And, and finally, um, outside the big names, who are your ones to watch that are coming through right now? I've got so many. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> Go on, just give me a list. Well, I'm firstly looking at the UK stuff and looking at some of these youngsters that I'd never heard of before, like Ammo Williams, um, that kid from New York, the Russian Ayubal, you know, kid. I'm looking at further up the lane, we're looking to see Anthony Sims Jr. get pushed and see what he can do. Over in the UK, there's a number of young talents, but they need, they need a bit more time. You know, when you're creating a masterpiece, it's not like painting by numbers. You can't rush it. It does matter if you go over the line into a nub. You've got to do the job properly. So there are kids over in the UK that I think are going to be sensational fires. I think Dubois has got an absolutely brilliant career ahead of him. Daniel Dubois, that is Dynamite Dubois, of course, who's not with you at the moment, he's with Warren. I would like to say at the moment is the greatest idea you've ever heard, and I'm sure Frank will be doing everything he can to keep him. You like the look of him, though, yeah? I like the look of him a lot. But not just... World champion in making? Not just from the boxing, you see. That's the thing. I look to build the personalities and to build the glamour. Being good is great, but being famous makes you money. It's a weird thing, isn't it? You know, it's not, I mean, the MMA fighter, the Irish boy, that made that fought Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor. Yeah. Do you think he's any good? I don't, but he's ever so no, famous. He's very, very good. He's is very, he? very good. Yeah. Well, listen, I'll give you... Not very, very good when he's up against Floyd no. Mayweather, the professor of boxing, but no, as a, as a marketeer as and a as a fighter, fighter, he was the right man in the right place at the right time doing and saying the right I thing. Need, I need the raw material to work with, to put into the system, to understand our fighters can be part of their own marketing campaign. Daniel, people like Dubois treated properly and with by some people that understand the market and have the money to say this is what's on offer we can offer so much more than any other operator in the world in fact i don't think it'll be that long before we are basically the only operator in the world but don't worry the sport's in good hands is there anyone else you pick out in the uk well, I've put, Dan, I've put Dubois under the spotlight, so... You have, definitely. I mean, in, in a way... But he's not with you at the moment. No, no, no. But it doesn't mean to say I don't think he's a talent, yeah. does it? I mean, yeah. I, what I'm saying is no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to steal a contract here. I'm just saying I'm representing... And I think it's big of me to say someone not under my yeah. control. No, I agree, I agree. Yeah. For the future. When I, when I look elsewhere, I'm looking at some of the talent that we've got. I mean, it's a fascinating game because they... They promise much and then move one step up and they're out of their depths. Joshua Boatsy, I wanted to say to you, well, he looks like a great talent. Again, again, of the fighters under our control in the UK, he has absolutely everything. E absolutely everything. Great feet, he's Ghanaian, so I know he's teak tough. He can have a standout row in the gym and he's a God-fearing Christian who will be portrayed as being a really good guy. He's a wonderful individual. He, but he's the type of kid, not saying just for me, but the whole ethos of what we do in sport, whether it's a snooker player, whether it's a dart player, whether you play 10-pin bowling or whether you go fishing, we're trying to make these characters, these personalities stand out. It makes our events better and bigger and it makes their life far more financially viable and, and makes them famous, which is at the end of the day, you don't want to be a secret, do you? Don't be a secret. It's a waste of time. You and I have never been secrets. People know where to find us. That's the essence. You've been listening to another Fighting Spirits podcast with me, Gareth A. Davis. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to my website, garethadavies.com. See you next time.